Emerson is the uh, technical evangelist for a company called Applause. Fun story about Applause. So I've been doing this for just about 10 years. One of my very first conferences, uh, one of my very first sponsors was Applause, the previous iteration of the same company. It's so great to have you guys back, Emerson. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take it away. Let's give it up for Emerson. All right, so uh, th thank you, Pete, very much for the introduction. Like he said, my name is Emerson Sklar. I'm a technical evangelist here with Applause. Applause is the world's largest, most successful crowdsource testing and feedback organization. In addition to the technical evangelist role, I'm also a solution architect, and I just completed my 18th summer volunteering for the Boy Scouts of America, which is really what I credit to giving me this kind of fascination with delighting customers, with finding out how to exceed customer expectation. So I, I have two things that I'd like to accomplish during the session today. First is to share some of my experiences, why some of the biggest brands in the world are struggling with voice, creating engaging and meaningful voice experiences today. The second is to discuss some of the best practices in testing and designing those voice experiences that you might be working on. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, voice is extraordinarily challenging. A lot of brands are, are really struggling. They're struggling because organizations like Amazon and Google are innovating at a pace that many companies struggle to keep up with is, is a real challenge. They're struggling because the standard tools and methodologies, the, the typical ways that we've tested and designed things in the past, really are not a great fit for voice user interfaces. Uh, they're also struggling because with the addition of voice, we have now nearly infinite complexity in trying to model what the interactions that our customers or our target audiences are going to have with our experiences. Things like languages, dialects, colloquialisms, weird environmental conditions. It makes it, makes it quite a challenge for people to really test and, and simulate inside of a lab. And I, I love this quote. You may have seen this on, uh, on LinkedIn or on Twitter from Alberto Brea. Uh, it says, you know, Amazon didn't kill the retail industry. Retail did it themselves for bad customer service. Uh, Uber didn't destroy the taxi industry. The taxi industry did it because I'm sure we can all agree taxes are disgusting and unreasonably expensive. Uh, really, it, it, it sums it up that technology itself is not the actual disruptor. New technology is not the disruptor. It is not being customer centric, not being a good advocate or good uh, preparer for the things that your customers have in mind. And there are organizations, Forrester, Gartner, Software Engineering Institute, all, all get together every year and all agree that really the only way to differentiate yourself in what is becoming a crowded digital marketplace is through positive customer experience. So I'd love to stand up here. I'm sure Applause would love me to stand up here and talk about the ways that Applause came about, that it's a natural genesis from the kind of traditional methodologies of testing and, and outsourcing. We'd love to stand up here and, and talk to you guys about how different uh, other thought leaders, people like Taryn Peterson, who's an Alexa champion, VP of tech at uh, Capital One, have also come to the realization that crowdsourcing is really the only way to get that true customer perspective. Uh, but instead, I'd, I'd rather use the next 13 minutes or so to leave you with some actionable insight that you can bring into your businesses today to help change the way that you are designing and refining your voice experiences. So the, the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, Amazon is an extraordinary advocate, an extraordinary resource in trying to figure out what it is that makes skills successful. They did a study of the most successful, engaging, beloved skills, and they found kind of four characteristics that all of those skills, all those voice experiences share. Quality, engagement, monetization, and multimodality. And from that, we at Applause have kind of sat down and, and broken down four different best practices in designing and refining voice user experiences, as well as three different new methodologies for testing those that are not necessarily totally new. They really are kind of refinements, nat natural evolutions of the types of practices that you guys have been putting in, in, in place today. So the first best practice is selecting the proper use cases, and that really begins with identifying what type of voice platform you're going to be deploying this experience onto. Some of those uh, limitations are uh, technical in nature, differences in automated speech recognition, natural language understanding between Amazon and Google, the different uh, near and far field microphones that the Amazon Echoes versus the Google Home devices have. Some of them are, are much more subjective in nature, like what your actual customer's expectations are for when it is right to use a certain voice platform. Statista has a great dossier that they publish about every two years with the impact of smart speakers. And it's fascinating to go and look at when customers think it's right to use Alexa versus when customers think it's right to use Google Assistant. And it's, it's not necessarily, or it reveals that our customers are not necessarily actually technically informed about the, real, the realities of these different platforms. But it is something still that if we're going to be investing our time, our uh, effort, ultimately our dollars to try and develop for, still something we need to accommodate. 
Uh, the second is you need to determine your strategy for multimodality. Are you going to be creating simply brochureware? Are you going to create a fairly static platform that uses audio and voice just as a mechanism to serve up content to users? Or is it going to be direct and engaging and, and kind of in both directions? Think about the, the Trivial Pursuit skill that uses the Amazon Echo buttons to provide a new mechanism for users to interact with it to drastically increase that, that user engagement. The second part is that you need to hope for the best and, and plan for the worst. Users, especially with voice, will use whatever interface they find most convenient at the time that they find it convenient. And in a lot of cases, they're actually going to switch input modalities midstream. And so you can try and limit what platforms, limit what ways users can interact with your brand. The, the better practice is to go and provide a consistent, optimal brand experience, regardless of which way customers are interacting with you. Uh, the, the third thing to remember is to fully embrace shift left testing. You can uh, adopt things like test-driven development, which is made a great deal easier if you have an automation strategy, something like what Bespoken offers. Uh, we as a community as well need to get people to fully embrace the agile development methodology. We need to try and shy away from uh, water scrum fall, agile waterfall, this kind of hybrid that most companies are in between the old school and the new school style of development. We need to make sure that we are getting working code into the hands of our customers as early as possible to be able to collect their feedback. Part of that as well is not reinventing the wheel. You don't want to spin your wheels by trying to create something new in this space. You have thought leaders within your organization. All of you here today are thought leaders. There are vendors, people like Applause, lots of other organizations that can guide you kind of on this practice and help share with you what some of those best practices are. Second best practice is optimizing content. Once you have decided what those, uh, what those use cases are, you, you want to find a way to increase engagement throughout the life cycle of your customers. One of the ways you can do that is through gamification, which is becoming incredibly popular, has kind of become pervasive and spread across many different business units. And, and the nice thing with voice is that unlike with a graphical user interface where people really know like what they can click on, they know where all the buttons are, in voice a lot of times users don't actually know exactly what they can interact with. And you can use that to your benefit by uh, cleverly guiding or manipulating them through your user experience to ensure at the end of the day they get the warm and fuzzies, they actually think they've had a positive experience with it. Similarly, the, if there's one thing that I've learned, it is that we as technologists, we as forward thinkers may not be great advocates for what our actual customer expectations are. You need to make sure that you are getting feedback directly from your customers to ensure that you enhance and refine the experience that you're providing them. And you got to do that in a non-intrusive, ideally non-biased way. I, I don't think we as an industry really have fully grasped what the actual implications are of in-skill advertising. So you want to you want to try and leverage beta communities, your passionate fans. You want to try and leverage uh, crowdsourcing organizations to go and find a mechanism to capture that re real unbiased user feedback from your target demographic. The third part is that the kind of double-edged sword of users not knowing exactly what kind of interaction they're allowed to have is that users will necessarily go astray as they're interacting with your, uh, with your experience. Even if it's a trivially simple experience, they, they will necessarily have some trouble kind of walking through it. So you need to embed into your skill, into your life cycle, you need to embed a mechanism where users, where you can track where you can log where it is that users are having trouble, where they are going astray, and then use that as you release new versions of your software, use that to refine the experience. Third best practice is eliminating friction. One way that you, in your voice user interface development, one way that you can get a little bit of a buy, a little bit of a leeway from your customers is by assigning your voice interfaces a personality. And that personality drastically increases engagement, drastically increases retention if you get it right, it drastically reduces both if you get it wrong. So you need to sit down and think, what perspective do I want to give my customers through this new interface? What, what picture or who do I want them to picture in their minds when they think about my brand? And you need to realize that that will not just stay in the voice world, that, that will, will pervade across all of the different interfaces, all of the different touch points that your brand has with each of your individual users. Uh, the, the second part, and this I think is unique to the voice world, is that you really want to make sure you don't blame or chastise the user. Unlike in the, the graphical world where you can say, oh, you clicked on that button wrong, you didn't provide the right user input, and people kind of shrug it off, they don't really think about it. In, in the voice world, if you tell a user that they did something wrong instead of putting the onus on you and your skill that you didn't understand or you, you got it wrong, not only does it negatively impact their sentiment of what this whole voice experience is, but it negatively impacts their sentiment of your brand and much more worryingly negatively impacts their sentiment of them themselves. It causes people to second guess, to, to worry about their own performance, and that's not something that we as ethical developers want to do. 
You also need to make sure that you provide a clear and easy mechanism for them to ask for help. Even if you have an experience that is maybe not totally conducive to pausing midstream, you need to make it clear to your users that they can ask for help and that it's okay for them to do so. You want to you give a mechanism that is customized to your experience, but you want to ensure that you try and clarify as much of the functionality as possible. The, the final part of eliminating friction is actually validating in the real world with real people on real devices, validating the impact of that chosen voice platform that you selected initially. Some of those things are like environmental conditions, multiple people, speakers, multiple connected speakers that you might have out in the wild. Some of those things are, are challenging input. If your voice experience needs to take input from the user in complex ways, long lists, uh, email addresses, strings of alphanumeric characters, last names, uh, you, you need to really sit down and say, can a user provide this feedback to me? Can they put this input in, in a non-trivial fashion? And if not, how do I cut it out? Because it is something that is going to reduce satisfaction with your experience, something that's going to increase friction. Final best practice is evolving with your customers. The experience a customer has the first day they work with your skills should not be the experience that they have several weeks later. Some of it is personalization of that interaction model based on what their level of familiarity is. You want to make sure that, that you are not trying to constrain them based on the development choices that you've made, that you really are adapting to the real world ways that users are interacting with, with your experience. Think about if I have a tutorial at the beginning of my skill and a user is using it three times a day, every day for a month, at some point they're going to start becoming dissatisfied with, uh, with that tutorial. They want to skip right to the meat of the experience. You also want to figure out, to increase engagement, to increase retention, you want to figure out how to become a habit. What, what key functionality is it that is preventing somebody from using you every day or every week or every month? The ways to do that is, again, to collect real feedback with your real customers. You want to do uh, very minor A-B studies on proposed changes to see if it increases that kind of, uh, that kind of retention. You can do much more, much more formal longitudinal studies to try and, and you know, really get a perspective from your target profile, from your target demographic or psychographic criteria. What is it that makes the difference for your real users? Uh, the, the last piece here is think about how someone might change their interaction, not just from a voice interaction space, but think from a platform, from a mode of input, how somebody's interaction might change as they become more familiar or more comfortable with your skill. Is there new functionality that you could enable for an expert user? Will, will an expert user versus a power user versus a novice user, will they all use the same Amazon Echo devices? Will they use the same types of mobile phones? Will they use the same automobiles to interact with your voice experience? So those are some of the best practices. If we, if we start to then think, how do we put this into place and how do we support our organizations actually meeting those best practices? There are, again, three different new types of testing, again, evolutions of existing types of testing that, that support it. The first is dialogue verification. And dialogue verification is ensuring, at the end of the day, that the voice platform that you've chosen can actually understand what your users are saying across all of the complex environments, languages, dialects, regional colloquialisms, ages, genders, that people are actually using to interact with it. Uh, it also lets you identify some quality issues that might be outside of your control. I, I mentioned last names. That is something that most uh, automated speech recognition tools struggle with today. Some of those things you, you can go back to Amazon, you can go back to Google and try and get them to refine. Some of them you need to find a way to code around to ensure that you provide that optimal experience. And so it's, it's the difference between saying in English, hey, Alexa, message Noel, I'll see you later. And Alexa saying, yeah, that's great. I'll send Noel that message. And you trying to say it in French, and Alexa saying, I'm sorry, I can't find any Noel who has the last name of I'll see you later. If we move then towards a little more formal type of testing, what we have is, is called in the wild functional testing. No longer can you get by actually replicating what your user experience is inside a lab. This, this is a great way to ensure out in the wild with real devices, real customers, that at the end of the day your experience simply works for those people. Part of this is, is validating the multimodality strategy that you've put in place. So if I go and I start listening to an audiobook as soon as I wake up at my house on the Amazon Echo, I get in my car to drive to the office and I pull up the Audible app on, uh, on my car, and then I get out of the car, pull it up on a web browser once I get into the office, is that a seamless experience? Does, do each of those interfaces reflect well and work seamlessly interacting with the brand? You also want to make sure that you have a mechanism to validate your monetization scheme. If, if users are struggling to give you their money or if they're desperate to give you their money, you want to make sure that there are no speed bumps, there's nothing in, in the way blocking them. And really, the only way to ensure that people can actually complete real transfers is to test real transfers with real people. Uh, the, the final 
uh, testing approach is what we call exploratory feedback. So it's much lighter weight than conducting a kind of heavyweight usability study, which still have value in this, but you want to be able to conduct these rapidly and often and let your real users test beyond the use cases that you've defined. Because of that infinite complexity that voice adds into this world, there's no way you can have test cases that describe all of the ways people might interact with your skills. But as soon as you release that skill, as soon as you put it out into the market, your real customers are going to find those things that you didn't plan for. It's much more advisable to get that into the hands of your customers before it reaches wide market penetration and to identify if there are any engagement, any retention blockers, things that are going to, at the end of the day, prevent people from having a, a wonderful, seamless experience. So I'm, I'm almost done. I got about a minute left. I want to leave you with three things. Uh, first is that as an organization, you need to sit down and identify what your voice engagement strategy is going to be. Are you treating voice with the same care, the same respect, the same time and effort and dollar investment that you are treating mobile and web? Uh, there are lots of organizations that can help guide you on this path. I've put, this should be familiar for anybody who's done any agile development. We, we can, there are thought leaders within your organization, there are other vendors who can help guide you on what the best strategy for that, but you need to determine if it is a realistic and effective thing for your brand. Uh, the second part is that you personally should take this as a potentially once in a lifetime opportunity to make a real impact, make a real impact on our organizations, make a real impact on our real customers, and make an impact on a burgeoning market where really there is plenty of room for people to stake their claim and have a positive impact to uplift all of us through this kind of successful engagement. Uh, the third part is we have a, a pretty interesting blog. We post not just about the voice world, about all sorts of different interesting topics. We actually have a white paper that's coming out, I think, next week on a much more detailed version of that end-to-end -end SDLC, the new skill dev life cycle. Uh, we have some coming out about the impacts of internationalization and localization between the Alexa and uh, Google infrastructures. have some more that, that are kind of secret, so, so please, uh, please feel free to check us out. Um, that's about all I have. Before I go, I want to thank uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. I want to thank Motive and thank Pete for putting on really an extraordinary conference. It is amazing to see as large of a group as we had of, of really thought leaders coming together to advance this field, to work together, to, uh, to, to collaborate, to, to learn from each other, and to share experiences that they've had. So my name is Emerson Sklar. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Emerson.